Uh, okay, we'll start with a word about spoilers. Um, we uh, will not be holding back when it comes to pandemonium, because it's been out long enough that you all should have read it. Uh, we will be a lot vaguer uh, when it comes to uh, uh, The Devil's Alphabet. Um, I am going to completely spoil future book stuff. Oh, sure. That, that's obvious. Everybody dies at the end. <laughs> Um, okay, um, so uh, this is our guest of honor, Daryl Gregory. I hope you've, you've all uh, uh, seen <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Wait, you drink every time you say my name? Is that what <laughs> Founded back when I accidentally said Neil Gaiman. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, you guys are great. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is a better. Bit. This is clearly a, a, a far superior audience. Um, my, my my first question, uh, Daryl, is what the hell genre are your books in? <laughs> The house of genre has many rooms. <laughs> and you put and bits of your room, of your books in each one? You're allowed to use the furniture from all of them. I don't understand the question. Now, um, I'm, I'm really aware of genre, because I grew up in genre, but like the way I grew up reading, I think, is the way most of us read, which is you're reading all of it. And so all of it is in your head, and these things in your head uh, have sex with each other, and then they make strange babies, and they come out the way they come out. And and um, so you're allowed to borrow from uh, all the genres. Um, so, like for instance, in Pandemonium, the reason why it's a confusing genre, um, uh, a confusing novel genre-wise. Um, well, first I'll say, I, the, the, the novel was being considered by the Philip K. Dick Award jury, and they, they, uh, that's an award for paperback science fiction, because Philip K. Dick, most of his science fiction uh, came out in paperback originals first. So it's a contest for paperback originals. And one of the jury members for Philip K. Dick came up to me afterward and said, you know, we loved your book, but we couldn't decide if it was science fiction or not, so we disqualified it. And I was like, well, if you're on the fence, throw me a bone. Keep it in, you know, keep it in there. Um, but, but Pandemonium is written specifically um, toward the idea of genre in that if something very weird is happening in the world, um, I was interested in the idea that not somebody's going to come up on page two and give you the explanation for what the weird thing is. Because it seems to me that a lot of novels um, hinge on the fact that if, if on page 300 even, the explanation is that it's science that's been doing it all along, that somehow changes the entire novel into a science fiction novel. But if the same character on page 300 says, well, you know, we had the, the curse of the old gods and that's why all this is happening, then suddenly you're in a fantasy novel. So I was really interested in the idea that um, not only do, should the reader not know, uh, but the characters should not know either. They, the characters should act as if this is the world they're in and they act realistically. And, and a lot of people read this novel first as science fiction because it's in a world very close to ours. And there are no clear answers and there are scientists studying the problem of these demons that seem to possess people. But no one has the right answer. No one has a definite answer because we're still collecting data. Um, and that reflected my experience of the world, which is there are lots of things we don't understand, and no one's walking into the room to offer us a clear explanation. We still don't know what thought is. We don't know what consciousness is. Um, there are lots of things we don't understand. So um, I was sort of avoiding having any clear answer. And so that's why Pandemonium is the kind of book it is where um, the characters don't know, and they don't act like they act in a fantasy novel. I was also annoyed. When you're writing your first novel, it's the only time you really get to sit back and call your shots, right? You've read, you've read everything, and you, you feel like you've got this one novel in which you can make your statement about everything you've read all at once, which is why you make usually really, really bad first novels, because you try to cram everything into them. And I have an unsold first novel, 
so this is technically the second novel I'd written. Um, but I wanted to comment on the idea that um, that uh, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, so your answer is the, oh yeah, I just I just wanted to avoid the idea that 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 anything would have come with a clear answer, and um, I could let the reader sort of try to figure that out as we went along. Okay, you used uh, the first novel uh, reasoning for that, um, but you don't really have that clear an answer, okay, at all, in the Thomas alphabet as well. It doesn't seem like you're interested in answers, except as alternatives. Well, uh, well okay, so that is um, that is one thing I'm really interested in, too, is I am more interested in a fact than answers. Like, I am really interested in what people do under strange circumstances and and how they act and how they react, um, I I do find that more interesting. Um, I was having a conversation uh, with someone here about um, Robert Charles Wilson, whose books I love. Um, but in some of his books, uh, the least interest, least interesting part is when somebody comes out and gives you the explanation for everything that's been going on, because you're so caught up in the story and the strangeness of the world. Uh, that the explanation part is kind of the, the least interesting part. Once the shark has come out of the water, uh, it ceases being scary and it's a little less interesting. So I am more interested in the fact than answers. Um, I'm more interested in probably premise than answers. Um, and in Devil's Alphabet, um, it is an underlying um, the only explanations that people come forward with in, in Devil's Alphabet are science answers for what's going on. Um, there's some, some of the people, the residents of this town of Switch Creek where all these mutations happen, do blame it on, some of them blame it on God, some of them do believe they're being punished, and so there's a reason why they're being, why this has happened to them. Um, but most of the other characters believe that it has something to do with science. Um, but I was resisting the idea of the person with the white coat coming in and saying, and now I have the explanation for everything that's happening. Um, I like this, the fact of unknowing, not knowing um, what exactly is going on. I know that's kind of weaselly. I just like that. Um, well, your, your, I think your endings can be described in two ways, depending on, on how people read books. <laughs> By which I mean, if you care about um, explanations, you might be very unsatisfied, but, but your characters seem to get at least some degree of closure. Yeah, you know, right. That's exactly what I'm interested in. I mean, I, my, my theory in those first two books, and that's true even of Raising Stony Mayhall, which is um, a story about a young, um, the last living dead boy in the world who believes he's the last uh, last of the zombies until he finds his own people um, and they've been living underground. Um, he's also scientifically minded in trying to find out what happens to zombies um, and how it's caused, but he doesn't get a really good answer either. Um, what was your question? I, I'm so tired. I, I... <laughs> um, I'll, I'll change tack a little bit and ask you about, about characters. Uh, oh, right. Oh. Okay. Did you want to? If you're trying to understand how you write. Exactly. Uh, first, first, you, you take the author to con and you exhaust them, and then you put it in front of your computer. That's. You lock your computer. That's how you Yeah. Um, when Ehud was talking about, about your writing uh, very movingly yesterday, uh, he said that what he loved about your books were the people who were in them. Uh, I, I think for me, I think for me, it's it's specifically family, and, and which you seem to be very interested in as a, as a writer. And yes, and I'll answer really quickly the the first question, which I remember my answer for now, which is uh, that the characters have some sort of closure. Yeah. Um, because yeah, even though maybe the larger questions of the world aren't answered, that everything is wrapped up. Like and now, this now we know exactly how the world works. Um, I do, I do uh, want the characters to be on a journey and to grow and and, and change by the end of it, um, and and have some sort of solution. So my theory has always been is that if you 
if you answer some questions or most of them, um, then um, they'll let you go um, with not answering all of them. So in Devil's Alphabet, there's a murder mystery, and you do find out the answer to the murder mystery. And the main character does uh, move from being kind of an empty 20-something who's not sure what he wants in life, violating every rule of my workshop, by the way. The whole novel is about a guy who, who uh, in his 20s, isn't sure what he wants and, doesn't, and, and isn't sure um, how he feels about his father, even as he keeps, you know, is, when he starts falling in love with him again and, and reconnecting with his father, um, isn't sure he ever even wants to be there. Um, so I'm interested in characters having that kind of um, journey and then hopefully not having to tie everything up at the end. Um, because in my own experience of the world is that it doesn't work like that. You don't get all the answers. So, you, so then you were saying about families. It is true, um, uh, that keeps happening over and over again. I, in, in a lot of short fiction, um, I write about friendships. I was um, telling someone that, that I was surprised at how often male friendships that you make when you're 12 or 13 kept coming out in my short fiction. Um, and then I was really interested in all the, I think all the novels are about family. Um, and not only the, I was interested in, in I, I grew up in a really normal family. Um, and so, I was, and, and we, we actually loved each other. I mean, we still fought and everything, but we, we loved each other. So I was interested in writing fiction where it wasn't just the usual kind of families that sometimes show up in fiction, which is, you know, a raging hellscape where the, um, where the, where some dysfunctional family provides the drama. I was interested in families that do love each other. Pandemonium, um, even though it's a very messed up situation, they're all watching out for each other. Um, in Devil's Alphabet, he's more disconnected from his father and his, and his extended family. Um, but there is something real there. And in Stony Mayhall, it's all about a family. It's, it's about um, uh, that zombie boy gets raised by a family of, of humans who are hiding him because they know if they, they, they let him, um, the authorities know they're just gonna shoot him in the head and burn him because that's what you should do with zombies. Um, and so it's about that adopted family that raises him. So I think every writer doesn't really have a choice about their themes a lot of times or what keeps coming back. It's you think you're starting off on this totally new course, you're gonna write this completely different novel and then the same stuff just keeps coming back in over and over again. And, um, and so you just sort of surrender to that. Um, I want to ask about evil, because um, characters do some terrible things in your novel, but I don't think, certainly in, in, in the, the two translated novels, um, there's, there's, I, I don't think there is evil in those books. I think there's viciousness and meanness occasionally, but not evil. Why is that? Despite the fact that horrible things happen. Well, I mean, I don't really believe in evil as an abstract thing that can take over people. Even though I'm writing about possession, I just don't... Um, I'm a materialist. I'm like the, a... The, the demons do what they do. The demons do what they do. And, and um, uh, yeah, so the, I, one of my teachers, I went to uh, Clarion. I don't know if you guys, you guys know, heard of Clarion. It's a writer's workshop. It's been running for 40 years. Um, and I went way back in uh, 1988, and one of my teachers was Kim Stanley Robinson, who was a fabulous writer and a really good teacher as well. But when you go to a workshop like that, and it lasts for six weeks, um, one of the biggest lessons you learn are, are after Clarion, when you start reading these writers. Like once you meet a writer, um, and especially if they've become a teacher, you start reading their stuff, and that's where most of the lessons come from. And I, I noticed in Stan Robinson's work, he loves all of his characters. Um, there's nobody who is evil, and he gives even sometimes the smallest characters who have done something awful. He will make time for a grace note or some um, small moment to offer maybe not redemption, but some sort of explanation, something from their point of view to see why they're doing what they're doing. Um, so yeah, in, in, in the two translated novels, uh, and even in Sony Mayhall, there's nobody who's uh, evil. Um, 
They just have competing wants and desires and they don't really match up with each other. In the book that's coming out in April, um, I do have a sociopath. He's a voluntary sociopath. Um, he takes pills so he can become a sociopath because it makes his job easier. Um, and uh, he's as close as I've come to an evil guy, but even when he's off, but when he's off those meds, he's kind of a sweet guy who raises miniature buffalo in his apartment. Um, and he takes care of them, and he's kind of sweet, and then he has to go to work, and he takes the pills, and he puts on the black hat. He literally puts on a black hat, my nod to um, just the stereotype. And then he goes to work and becomes a, a, a guy who hunts down and, and tortures people uh, to get information. Miniature buffalo? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How yeah. miniature? I'm sorry, I, I, I'm really Okay, so this is, so, all right. Um, a friend of mine wrote a story uh, that he couldn't publish for years, but then now it just came out in FNSF uh, a couple uh, months ago, about buffalo that were about three feet high, and they were just more portable. You could raise them in smaller farms. Uh, and I thought, and I, he asked me to critique the story, and I said, that's great, but they should be the size of hamsters, and you could keep them in your house. And, you, and so I, when I was writing this novel, I said, I needed a hobby for my sociopath torturer hitman. And, <laughs> And I said, can I use the miniature buffalo? And he said, by all means, they're all yours. <laughs> so I invented an entire, a, an entire uh, hobby that was based on, you could buy uh, carpeting that was, for, that was made of real grass so they could graze, uh, they could graze. And then um, there was a Pumba. So I, I don't know if you've heard of the Roomba, the little, uh, little robot. We, we, we have that. This is a Pumba that would smell poo. Um, <laughs> It would smell the methane and travel around your house uh, getting all those buffalo droppings, uh, those bison droppings out of your carpet. Um, and also, I, there, was a, there was something I, took, I had in that I took out because it was just going a step too far for some people, which is um, the George Foreman abattoir. So you could, you could take your little bison and you could put them at one end and sort of push them through and it would and run them out and then you could make little meat patties and they could have little micro little, little bison patties. Uh, we, 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 I don't think we have the George Foreman grill. It is, it is a super popular uh, uh, grill in, in America. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just got a little excited about the meat. <laughs> no, it was awesome. It was, it was, yes, that's it. Adorable and delicious. <laughs> Try to stay on track. I dare you to keep me on track. We, when we're going, we don't need roads or a track. Um, let's go back to, to again, the, the novel that, that we're not afraid to spoil. Um, um, where did demons come from? I don't mean in the book. I don't want you to explain what you did explain in the book. I mean, uh, for you. Um, my first published short story. Or you could explain what you didn't explain in the book. That would also be good. Right. Awesome. I won't explain what, what they are in the book. Um, but where I started thinking about my first published short story was a story called In the Wheels that I wrote at Clarion in, in, in 1988. Um, the first published short story, um, and it's a typical story about demonic possession and drag racing in the post-apocalyptic world. As you, as you do. Uh, one thing I'm signaling very early on that I had a problem staying within the genre uh, uh, guidelines. Um, so, I, and I think I kept, and I, and, and I keep coming back to this in story after story and in the novels, which is I obviously am a little freaked out by the sense of self and whether we have a continuous self, and whether what happens when another uh, consciousness takes over the body. Um, so that theme of like having something take over your, your body, I kept coming back to over and over again. But in Pandemonium too, I also wanted a, a good excuse to write about superheroes and pulp figures and um, not, um, and not do a typical superhero novel. So I was trying to come up with an explanation that would give me this um, um, something like superpowers. Um, and so it basically comes down to some of the things that you learn about hypnosis or those stories about people who having, you know, using all their strength 
uh, during great times of great crisis where normally they couldn't do that kind of thing. I was thinking, well, these demons would have no trouble just wrecking your body if they took it over to fulfill these stories. And so Pandemonium is a mashup novel about all the things I grew up reading and loving. And I was wanting to put as many of those characters into um, the novel as possible. So I've got you know, lots of different demons that do different things and tell their stories, are trying to tell their stories over and over again. And the problem with them, of course, is that pulp stories and, um, and, and well, archetypes in general, they're kind of static, right? They try to tell the same stories over and over again. Um, and I was interested in that. Religion has a very interesting place in your books in that it is not the topic, but it is not uh, non-existent, which, which is usually uh, where religion falls in, in science fiction. It's either it's a book about a religious issue or there's none of that, or it's very little, small, but it, it played a major role in your work. Uh, uh, how come? Um, I was, because I was raised by a Southern Baptist uh, fundamentalist um, Protestant, and we went to church a lot. When you go to church a lot, um, uh, what's the word for this? You get bored. <laughs> and so one of the ways that my uh, parents would keep me in the pew was to give me uh, notebooks. They said I could write and draw and do whatever I wanted during church. So um, I, yeah, I wrote a lot of early really bad stories in fifth grade, you know, on, on the, in these notebooks because um, you're bored at church. But obviously something is seeping through when you, when you grow up in a culture like that. Um, it now became later impossible for me to write anything without seeing some sort of Christ image and, and working in um, thoughts about religion because I came um, from that culture. I was very involved in church all through growing up. I sang, uh, I don't know if anyone knows what a gospel quartet is, but... Um, it's like a, it's a quartet, and you go from church to church, and you sing, and uh, I did that for a while. I was very involved in church, and then, and then I basically, uh, over time, had to uh, come out as an atheist. And I, but, so I'm really interested in that, that journey, because I see the trap. I, I don't want to, quote, demonize religion, because it was very important to me, and there are some, and for a lot of people, um, it's a very important, useful, and good thing. I know alcoholics who feel like they would still be drinking if they hadn't uh, found Jesus and been saved. And so um, I don't want to, um, I never try to treat religion lightly, and I don't mock it, but I am really interested in the process of religion and the process by which people are always um, turning anything into a religion as well. So there are a couple stories, short stories that are explicitly about religion. Damascus is like that. That's now out in, in, in Hebrew. On, um, is that the ISSF site? Uh, yeah. I forget who it is. Damascus is on that site. Um, and um, the next novel, After Party, which will be out in April from Tor, is explicitly about um, uh, religion and neuroscience. Uh, but yeah, it keeps, coming, it keeps coming back. I'm just really interested in it. Um, you got recently, well, not that recently, but, but in the last few years, you've become a comic book writer. Um, how had that come about? And, and when, when you think of the different works you do, what makes you say, this is a, a comic book story, this is a short story, this is a novel? Right. Well, like most things, uh, the reason why I'm in Israel, by the way, and Ronnie has told the story, is because of Chris Robertson. So Chris hands Ronnie uh, a copy of Pandemonium and says and that you will love this. And I didn't really know Chris Robinson. Gary K. Wolf handed that book to Chris and said, what's that? I didn't know that. Yeah, Gary Wolf read it and said, Chris, this is right up your alley. It's about superheroes. And, and then Chris is like, blows my mind. Uh, he used lots of F words in that sentence. Uh, and uh, then he became my friend. And then he, I didn't even know he'd like, got Ronnie involved and said, you, you need to read this. And so Chris also got me into comics because I became friends with Chris. And Chris and Bill Willingham, um, who's been here, and um, 
several of my friends wrote comics, and I expressed my extreme envy. And I, because I had grown up reading comics, and um, Chris, because there was no way to tell that from reading. I know exactly. Now, I imprinted at a very early age on Captain America, and like it's like you have no choice about your superheroes. Like my son imprinted on Thor. I mean, when he was like five years old, he was saying, "I say thee nay," um, for no running around hitting things with a hammer for no reason. You know, it's like, well, I guess that's his hero. You just get your superhero card when you at some point, um, and. So I grew up reading comics, and then so Chris had handed pandemonium to uh, these comp book, this comic book company called Boom Studios, and then they called me up and said, hey, uh, we've got this Dracula comic, uh, would you like to write it? And I, I had no interest in writing a Dracula comic, but I was very interested in writing comics and also writing them with Kurt Busiek, who's a great comic book writer um, and a legend, and, I, I, and the deal would be that Kurt had this outline for a series, and they needed a script writer. And uh, I met with Kurt, and he was like, once, once we get started, it's all yours. Like, you need to change it and follow the story for whatever works, and that was very freeing. And so that's how I got into comics. And the second part of your question um, is about, like, how do you tell a story or not? Well, what kind of story is it? Right. Um, Here's the thing, I, um, I sort of give my brain orders. So um, you tell your brain, uh, I need a comic book story, or I need a short story, or I need a novel. And then the brain has to go work on that. Um, and then if you tell the brain, uh, someone's going to pay you for this, um, they, they, it works even harder. And if you sign a contract, the brain panics um, for a little while, but then it gradually, it, it'll eventually fork over the goods. And so I, I don't have this thing where I've got like a, a pool of ideas and then I try to say, well, that seems like a short story idea. Um, I've never been somebody with a lot of, like with a, a list of here's everything I want to work on um, in order. Chris Robertson's one of those kind of writers. He's got, a, he's, got a, he's got a bucket list of all the things he wants to do and he's, he's, he's ticking them off one by one. Um, so for me, it's, um, I, uh, I either give myself an assignment and say, I, I'm interested, I want to write a short story, so let's go work on a short story. Um, I like, for example, I, had, I wanted to write a story that was short enough for me to read aloud. Um, so I wrote a story called Digital, because I thought it'd be funny to write a story about something where the consciousness moves from behind your eyes to your index finger of your left hand, so I could stand on stage while reading it with my left hand looking at the audience. Um, uh, so yeah, you give yourself a size, and then it comes up with ideas for those sizes, and for those word lengths sometimes, specifically those word lengths. Um, that, following up on that, on, on, on how you work, uh, one of your teachers in Clarion was another former icon guest of uh, on yeah. Tim Powers, the awesome Tim Powers. Uh, and the way Tim works is, before he starts writing, he knows everything that's going to happen. He has charts. He has graphs. <laughs> he comes across as this guy who's like, yeah, you know, you sit down, you write, it's the greatest thing in the world, you just do it, but he's the most, he, he's got the, the, the greatest work ethic in science fiction. How much do you know when you start work, when you start work writing? Um, I know the beginning, and I know the end, and I know maybe a couple tentpole events in the middle, um, but um, I don't know a lot of what's going on. And, and but I need, I used to, um, I think I was telling folks in the workshop this, that I used to start stories, because I just wanted to get started writing. I just wanted to write the story. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to put on that hat. And I would write myself into a corner, because it turned out I didn't have a story. I had a premise. Um, and I didn't have anywhere to go. And I didn't have any emotional thing that kept me into it. So I um, started waiting. Um, some stories I've waited 10 years because I didn't have an ending. I didn't know where they were supposed to go or what they were supposed to be. Um, and so if I wait, I have to know the ending. And it has to be an ending. It doesn't have to be the ending. I, it has to be uh, enough to fool me into thinking I could finish it. And then I start writing toward that ending. And then in the middle of it, I may come up with a better ending. Um, 
a lot of times I come up with a better ending while I'm in the middle of it, I know the story better, and then I feel free to change it, but I need to know the ending before I start. And I don't do a lot of, I don't do, I don't do like, um, you know, Tim's writing these densely historical novels with tons of detail, and um, I'm not usually doing that. Um, I do research, most of the things I'm interested in are neuroscience, and I'm reading that stuff all the time, and then when I figure out what a book is about, I may start diving deeper and reading more uh, about that topic, but um, I don't do it like, um, like Tim does. I don't know if anyone does it as well. Well, I do know Rudy Rucker, for example, writes, he, he recently posted like, well, I've, my, my words are, I've got like 120,000 words of notes, so I'm about ready to start the novel now. I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> That's disturbing. Um, okay, uh, we're going to open up the floor to, to some audience participation with questions. Um, raise your hand if you have a question. I'm just really interested in it because I'm interested in the illusion that we have that there is this contiguous, continuous self uh, that makes some kind of sense. I'm really interested in the idea of that we tell stories to ourselves to convince ourselves that uh, we are a consistent person. Um, and, I'm, and also I'm a materialist, so um, I'm not a dualist. And, 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 you probably should body. explain that a little. All right, so in the, in the, there's always this quite, there's, it's called the mind-body problem, where you're trying to figure out the relation of the mind to the body. Um, and so, um, you, um, you know, a couple hundred years ago, you might have believed, okay, there's a little homunculus, there's a little guy behind the wheel, uh, sitting there in the middle of our brain, uh, near the pituitary gland, and that's where consciousness sits, and it kind of, kind of steers the body around. Um, and there's this kind of idea of, of, of dualism, like the mind is separate from the body. There's some, some mind thing out there that's controlling, um, that's expressing itself through the brain, but the mind is separate. There's philosophers like Roger Penrose, a mathematician who's proposing there's some quantum mechanical mind space uh, where all the computation happens and there's this uh, in, in that kind of computation, and then somehow that gets expressed out to the mind, to the brain, and that becomes what the mind is. Um, I'm a materialist and believing that there's nothing except the brain making consciousness. There is no separate thing going on, um, and that, um, that you can't have a mind without a brain, um, so there's no afterlife, um, there's nothing um, that can persist after you, after the brain stops working. Um, and, the, and we know from you know, a plethora of, of, of studies that the mind, the, the thing we call personality, is completely dependent upon structures in the brain and can be damaged by drugs, by strokes, um, by just growth, uh, growth of neurons, uh, by seizures in various lobes. You can change somebody's personality. So I'm really interested in how fragile the mind is. And so this idea that we're, um, um, that there's a true self, that there's an essence, there's an essential self, I think is an illusion. It's a very comforting illusion, um, but it's an illusion. So you're not scared of the brain, you just like scaring me? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's sort of my um, because I do think it's a very fragile thing. Uh, on the other hand, I'm perfectly comfortable, that, that illusion of the self is, a very useful thing. I don't think we could we could function without it. So um, it feels to me like there's a Daryl who's a, who's a conscious self who's talking to you right now, who's the same as the Daryl who was here yesterday. Um, but it ain't necessarily so. Um, you talked about 
little louder? Yeah. A little louder. You talked about the outlining process. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also like to hear about your research process from first draft to final. Okay. Um, I think every writer's process, when you hear about another writer, every writer hears another writer's process is kind of appalled that any work could be done by that method. Um, um, because I do things uh, that I wouldn't recommend, but that's the only way I seem to be able to write. So um, I know some people who are drafters, right? They can write a really um, uh, rough first draft just to sketch it, find out the bones of the story, and then they will go through and make another pass, and they will make another pass, and um, they're drafters. And then there's other people um, who, uh, I just learned this term that people call them pantsers, which is you write by the seat of your pants. And they just sit down and they just start writing, and then whatever comes out, and then and if you're a genius, uh, what comes out is actually a workable story. Um, I'm, um, the way I write is, uh, so I've got the outline, I've got the beginning and I've got the end and I've got some ideas, um, but I tend to write sentence by sentence and the sentences mean, um, they matter to me, like I, I'm discovering things in the sentences that tell me things about the character and sometimes you just need a sentence to be a certain length or a certain rhythm and it makes you write something about a character and then that becomes what the character is. I don't believe characters are independent of story and I also don't believe characters are independent of sentences. So um, they're made out of sentences. Um, so uh, I write sentence by sentence and I'm discovering who they are and discovering the world as I'm writing it sentence by sentence. So I'm very slow. So I can spend all afternoon, um, you know, tr trying to figure out, trying to get a paragraph right, um, because it's very hard for me to move past it, knowing that there's this damaged thing that's sitting there like a time bomb on my page. And I'm also very, I also get kind of worried that um, uh, that I will forget that the sentence is bad. Like if I don't fix it now, what if I forget about it and then it goes out and then the sentence is bad later and I've, I've, I've blown it. So when, when I translate I, I, and I have that, I put like three asterisks next to it, so I'll always be able to find the one that that asterisk is next to. I'm just saying. But see, then you go back to it later, like I do ZZZ, -Z -Z. Okay. so I go back to ZZZ -Z -Z and I'll think, well that sentence is not so bad, because I've forgotten why it's bad. <laughs> Right, little notes. I know there's all these kind of things that should be, should work, right? Um, uh, but um, uh, I don't think you. Some, you sometimes you just don't have a choice about your process. It's whatever, whatever works um, to to get to get the work done. Cat Rambo says, you know, try lots of different ways of writing, find out what works, and do that lots. <laughs> um, and the only thing that uh, ever helped me as far as writing is just. Um, what Jane Yellen calls um, uh, BIC, which is just butt in chair. That's the only, I mean, it's just time. Um, I have a question about, about pandemonium, um, which as I said, I don't have a problem spoiling. Um, uh, real people show up in it. One of, one of the, the many genres it's in is, is alternate reality. Um, and, and specifically, uh, um, former icon guests of, guests of honor, Tim Powers and Serena Powers show up, and, and so, so does um, Sinead O'Connor. I Howard. changed her name. <laughs> yeah, well, you also sort of changed. Oh, I also changed Tim. And yeah, Tim. yeah. Uh, Tom and oh. Selena, no one could ever tell. Yeah. Well, how did they show up? Um. I'm really interested in alternate presence. I'm not really interested in alternate history. Like, I don't want to tell the whole history, but I am interested in an alternate present that has an alternate history to it. Um, so, and I like that effect of being able to use real people and their alternates, um, because one, it's really efficient. Um, if I bring O.J. Simpson on, um, I don't have to explain everything that O.J. Simpson did. Um, uh, or allegedly did. Um, I could just execute him for his crimes right there on the page. Alleged crimes. Alleged crimes on the page. He committed those crimes in my world. He wrote a book called If I Had Done It, This Is How. This is writing, how. He's writing science fiction as well. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, I offer you questions like, is that legal to do that? And then I've done some research about what is legal and not legal. And if they're dead and you're talking about their public persona, that's legal to write about. Um, if, you're, if you're writing about real people using their names, but you're writing about personal stuff, I stay away from. You could probably get away from it, get away with it, but you may be sued. Um, and then um, uh, with, 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 with Tim Powers, I actually wrote him and said, here's this weird scene. Do you want me to keep your name or make up a new name? He's like, you, you should make up a new name. Um, so I do ask permission. I, I, I stay away from using real living people most of the time. Uh, unless they're public personas. Um, when, when we talked about San Antonio, uh, you said something that blew my mind, which is every part of, of the Chine, the Chivon Chine, uh, it, all of her history as a character is real. About oh yeah, because Sinead O'Connor is a piece of work. Uh, I love her. Um, my wife suspected that I had kind of a thing for bald women, and I kind of do. Uh, huh. Yeah. That's why I like Ronnie so much, you know, he's, he just, never mind. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, one of the interesting things is you dive into Shane O'Connor's life, I was really interested in this kind of mercurial personality who kept changing her beliefs kind of radically and would follow weird sch schismatic sects of Catholicism and she would declare herself a priest, and then she would go be a rock and roll star, and then she would be a priest again, and then she would, you know, start her own variant of the religion. Also, all that stuff, I basically just presented, and she sounds like a whack job. Um, and at one point, you know, one of the, in the first draft, some of my beta readers were like, look, you're doing a really bad job with her, because she's not consistent as a character. Um, <laughs> like, one minute she's like this, and then one minute she's like this, like, wake up your mind, and you know, describe her as, you know, and I'm like, well, she's not consistent. So I actually had, I actually have the main character Dell at one point say, I don't know what's happening. One minute you're this rock person, one minute you're this rock chick, one minute you're this priest, and then she's like, I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> so that's a technique you can use in fiction, which is just, you know, hang a lantern on it. When you, you know, just tell the reader, look, this is what we're doing. She doesn't make sense as a person. And we all know it. Yeah. Uh, next audience question. I have a question about your latest graphic novel, The Secret Battle of Genghis Khan. What made you so interested in that uh, period of time? The brutality, the, the mechanics of the Mongol Empire, the tragic life of Genghis Khan? Oh, uh, what made me interested was someone calling me and saying, we'd like to give you a lot of money if you'd write about Genghis Khan. <laughs> it, yeah, I'm a commercial writer, people. Um, um, and it, it's not, not commercial enough to stick to one genre, which I hear is commercial. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I could do better. So it, it is true. But with with work for hire stuff, I, um, I, I, you know, I have. A, it's not. It's not as personal to me. Um, um, but once I'm given a job, uh, I do feel like I own it, and I'm going to do everything I can to make it as good as possible and as interesting to me, Daryl, as I can, while still letting them uh, give me the money. Um, so Genghis Khan was an interesting thing where they called out, they liked Planet of the Apes. Uh, and, oh, and no, Chris Robertson gave me this job too. Like they called Chris for it first. He's like, I'm too busy, but Daryl's available. Um, and uh, it was kind of an impossible task. Because what they said is, look, we had some Mongolians call us. This is a true story. And they said, they want the life history of Genghis Khan in one graphic novel about 80 pages long. And they want us to, uh, this is IDW, the comic company, they want us to, to, um, to make the comic, and they're going to retranslate it back into Mongolian <laughs> and sell it in Mongolia as well as the United States. So I'm like, sign me up. Sounds perfect, makes perfect sense. It's the global economy, let's go. I, I'm a boy from Chicago with the perfect person to tell you know, the story of the national hero of Mongolia. Um, I'm hoping that I have this dream that someday I show up in Mongolia and he goes, Gerald Gregory. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but, uh, but, it, but it is, the, the interesting thing for me, the technical challenge was to do his entire life in 80 pages and they wanted to concentrate on the battles. Um, and so I called a friend of mine named Mark Teppo, who is a, who is a, a fanatic about Genghis Khan, and, and I said, 
you tell me the books to read. So I went and crammed and sped, you know, speed read uh, uh, several books on Genghis Khan. And the great thing about such a, gu a guy who lived so long ago is that the historical record is tremendously muddy and it's mixed with myth and it's mixed with things we actually know. And so um, I was allowed to choose as a writer which stuff I thought was the most interesting version of the story. Um, and also I, I really wanted to, um, uh, to, to tell the truth for what we know historically, that he was, did kill off a lot of people. Not as many as he's rumored to, ki to have killed off. There just weren't that many people even on the steps at the time. Um, for, if you add up all the numbers for all his alleged uh, numbers of people killed in each city, there's just, there just wasn't that many people on the planet at that time. Because um, everybody, propaganda worked for Genghis Khan as well as for his victims. He was, you know, they would, they would rack up the numbers. Um, so the, the trick was to do all this work um, and, and do it all in 80 pages. So I have, a, I have an um, older Genghis Khan telling the story of his, of his life, uh, which is a great trick to use as a writer because you can skip, right? You don't have to tell a contiguous story. You could say, and then 20 years later, um, and he could comment on it too because I had to do a lot of telling as well as showing because you just cannot explain all the civilizations and, and cities that he's conquering um, by just having you know having them uh, discovered in the in the in the story, you have to, to sometimes just tell them. So um, and I got to like him. I understood, and the, the I needed an emotional angle that would keep me interested. And the emotional angle was his relationship with his sons. Um, there, he was very concerned that after he died, his three sons would compete for the empire and tear it apart and tear each other apart. And so a lot of what hinges emotionally for me was him figuring that out and how to find a solution for that. Any question? Um, in the end, you find the money that's not spoiler. It's rather open ending where you do have some closure, but you do feel that the characters have other places they can go to and that they do tend to go there. Do you ever consider coming back to that, or are you just leaving it as is? I, I'm leaving it as is. I wanted the feeling that things could keep going and there was stuff that was unresolved that the characters could keep going. Uh, but for me, uh, the main character, Adele, his story is done. Uh, I couldn't figure out what I thought about, because I didn't entertain the idea, like, well, you know, this is pretty open-ended, I could come up with a sequel, but there was no story I was interested in with Dell. It was, and, and I have this problem um, with writing, um, and I had to learn how to do this with comics, um, but in novels, I have a problem with writing a, any kind of continuing character. It seems like the character story is so tied up with the world that when I finish that character story, I've sort of said everything I wanted to say about the world. The same is true with Sony Mayhall. You could keep going with the zombie story uh, and go further, but for me it was done. I sort of said everything I wanted to say about zombie novels and, and why they're so um, kind of disappointing. Um, and uh, and I was done by the end. So yeah, I, but I do like the thing that science fiction does really well, which is to open up at the end, um, to suggest that there are more possibilities and that larger changes are about to come come around. And I really like I've always loved that effect as a reader, and I really appreciate it um, in science fiction because some genres are about closing down. The thriller genre is about closing down, which is the returning to the status quo. The threat is past. We've somehow survived, and so we're back. Um, how do you feel about fan fiction? Because one of the things that fan fiction does is explore the open spaces that the canon might leave. And in case you didn't know, there isn't a lot, but there are a few pieces of fan fiction that work. So how do you feel about that phenomenon? With there's fan fiction on? Yes. I might, not a might. People write fan fiction yeah, right. about your, because as I said, the, the fan fiction exists in the, in the lips, in the space that the writer leaves, and you leave a lot of space. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have no problem with it. Um, I probably have a problem if they were selling it. Yeah, um, it's the whole thing about fan fiction. Yeah. It's not, it's yeah, it's not, it's not about, you know, um, except. People have tried to sell fan fiction. Um, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so I, uh, no, I have no problem. And, and, you know, every writer starts out as a fan fiction writer, basically. I mean, all my first novel in sixth grade, it was stunning, uh, was a mashup novel, frighteningly like Pandemonium, and the, but in, the, in it, G.I. Joe, Sherlock Holmes, Doc Savage from the Doc Savage pulp novels, um, get summoned by this kid with a, who builds his own crystal radio, and they save the world, and the whole novel is done in about 12 pages. Um, but it's all fan fiction. Uh, but, uh, who wants to read that novel? <laughs> Seriously. I found the copy of it. It's in my basement. No, 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 not, not the one you... You writing that novel now. Oh, God. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, no, so I, I mean, I think it's part of what we do. I mean, I think people who are, I don't understand why people are upset by fan fiction. I, I, I don't even understand really the argument that, um, that people would be upset that people would do this. Um, um, uh, I, there's a, there, well, I don't want to get into it, but there was a recent dust up on the internet uh, where Hal Duncan was talking about um, feeling like he was being um, told what his gay character should be thinking and doing, um, and he's like, "No, this is this is this is the way I wrote them. Um, you can't straighten them out, and you can't um, send them in other directions." I was making a point, and so he was resenting the slash part of the of the fiction exercise. Um, I uh, it doesn't really bother me. On on a somewhat related note, what do you think about piracy? <laughs> Somewhat related. Um, yeah, I'm um, okay. Piracy is a really useful marketing tool. Um, so my stuff is pi like most writers. My stuff is pirated a lot. It's on tons of sites. Um, even the stuff I've released on my own website has been pirated, and I'll put it in another forum somewhere else. Like, okay, well, thank you for disseminating that. Um, so, um, I think um, there's some people who feel very strongly about like hunting down pirates and, and stopping them. I, I just, it, it's like, uh, it's just part of the environment we're in right now. Piracy is going to happen, and you can be very upset about this. Um, I do think that it spurred publishers on to be uh, like the iTunes model, which is most people are happy to to get a good quality version um, at a reasonable price and make it convenient to get. And um, people are making plenty of money um, self-publishing, buying e-books from regular publishers. Um, and I think most readers, if they had decent access, would would pay for it, especially if it's, if it's reasonable. Um, uh, I think it's, it's primarily a distribution problem, and piracy, when it is, is, in its most extreme forms, is, a, is basically a comment on um, how publishers have been doing it badly. sentences, uh, but if they don't serve the story or they impede the story, the larger needs of the story, then the sentences have to go and you have to rewrite them again. That's why, from an economic sense, it makes no sense to polish these, some of these sentences, because you may have to cut them. Um, and, and one of the toughest things about writing um, the way I do is not only the time it takes to write them and then cut them later, but in the rewriting, yeah, you are changing things. And so I... Um, I'm always living in terror of I've changed my mind about something and it's not consistent anymore, especially in a long work. In a novel, you just can't hold the whole thing in your head like you can with a short story. And so um, I'm always worried about if I'm changing my mind about something later and changing this sentence, um, then I've changed something that they're out of character or they're not even, the facts aren't even correct anymore early on. But you have to do it. I mean, it's just, it's just part of the job. It's just 
um, you you have to edit. So uh, and hopefully the edits make it better and not worse. A little louder. How do you think what you read affects how and what we write about? Uh, yeah, it's, it's in my mind it's completely entwined. I mean, there's even this debate about whether you can even teach writing at all. I think you can give tips. I think you can give advice, but I don't think you can teach people um, how to write. Um, I think it completely depends on reading as much as possible and then writing as much as possible. And that's the only way I think you actually, you really learn how to write. Um, you, can, you can pick up tools and tips and things to try to make it better, uh, but it's not going to turn a non-writer into a writer to read a bunch of tools and tips. Um, so for me, reading, uh, like you can tell from Pandemonium, it's all of, everything I've really written is completely tied up with what I've read and they're, in, they're inseparable. So, um, and I read, you know, both the high and the low, like low culture stuff, like comics and stuff I grew up with, I had a great love for. And then um, I was a literature major, so I, you know, I read through the canon. Um, and I remember the comic books a lot more clearly than I remember uh, the stuff I was supposed to be studying. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's completely entwined. I, I don't see, I, don't, I mean, I do read some writers that I suspect that they've written more than they've read. Um, because they're just writing too many novels, and I think you can't possibly be reading as many novels as you've, as you've written. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Some, some people have, have uh, um, I, when I was at Worldcon, I interviewed uh, Sean McGuire and I asked her, how, how can you write as much as you do? And she said, oh, CD. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, did you see uh, Wolf Wolford College did a, a, a web page a, a while back, they asked a bunch of writers to write their writing advice on their hand and take a no, picture of it. That, and that was, that was, that, when you have to sum it up to what you can write on a hand, then pretty much every advice was, was something I think a writer could use. When you go longer, then, then right. your, your mileage may vary a lot more significantly. Thinking 
like uh, that the professor's looking over their shoulder, um, even when they're just trying to write a first draft, and I've seen people be paralyzed by that. Because um, writing is, you know, half free creativity and then, and then applying an analytical end to it, and if it's way too much on the analysis, you just get paralyzed. Okay, obviously we're going to Canada now to have some sort of chance to survive. <laughs> Four comics. Four. How do you feel when the artists get it wrong? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, well, it, it, this is the cool thing about comics is that it's such a collaboration, and I've worked with really good artists. Um, and uh, I could talk for a while about all the things I've learned about how comics has changed my own writing, um, especially even my prose writing. Um, you know, being uh, more parsimonious, like picking, instead of writing three lines of dialogue, picking the one key line of dialogue that really makes a difference, because you only, you have all these space considerations, and you want the art to have as much room to breathe and do its work as possible. Um, and I will get to the answer to your question in a second, but I also want to talk about one thing that was really cool about comics, printed comics that I worked on, is that the physical act of reading um, affects the story. It's a really strict form. It's like writing a sonnet. So they're, they're either 20 pages or 22 pages um, for the full comics. And if you want a surprise to happen, it needs to happen on a page turn. So it needs to happen on the even page. So I'm looking at page one, and I want to have somebody uh, jump out and scare somebody. It has to happen on a page turn. If I want a two-page spread, it has to happen on page like a, a, on an even odd. Uh, combination of pages. And um, you want the last final, you want a certain feeling when you get to that last page, you turn over that last page, and that's the thing that's supposed to keep their interest for an entire month. I, and so figuring out how transitions work in comics, how much time jumping you could do, how much characters, um, how much you could actually fit on a page. Uh, um, I had very good advice from Bill Willingham and Chris Robertson and some other people when I started, and I kept because reading a lot of comics turned out to be not great preparation for writing them because I hadn't been thinking critically while I was reading them. I was just enjoying them. And then I had to go back to some of my comics to figure out how do they work? How are they doing some of their effects? And that was tremendous fun to learn that a new discipline, a new way of writing. So um, it is true, like I've had some tussles with, with the artist saying, no, I really pictured them this way and this is the kind of effect I want. Um, but most of the time, they're coming up with things I had never thought of. And I learned in my scripts to leave lots of space for them to create things. There's this great moment in, in uh, Planet of the Apes, in an early issue, and I said, I need two thugs, two burly guys, because they're gonna escort this character out. And Carlos, the artist, Carlos Mango is fantastic. He lives in Brazil, he's a great guy. He drew the hell out of these two guys. He made one of them kind of like an Indian, like from uh, the village people. Um, and who was, who was a big burly, he was a white guy, but for some reason he dressed himself in war paint um, and had a headdress and um, had these two guns strapped to his side. And then the other burly guy, that's all he was in the script, had these steampunk goggles um, and a tiny monkey on his shoulder. And he looked like a pirate with a little monkey instead of a parrot. I'm like, these guys are fantastic. So, um, and just the idea that you would have a tiny monkey in the Planet of the Apes, where you got the big apes that talk, and the tiny monkeys you don't, it was, I, just, I fell, fell in love with it. Because as I was thinking, if, we, if this series goes on, on long enough, the monkey becomes the narrator, I was thinking. <laughs> but, so anyways, these two characters were so riveting, they were so beautiful, and so well thought out by Carlos. They got names, they got backstories, and by issue 12, they had a completed story arc, both of them. Both of them get uh, tragic deaths. Uh, but noble, noble, noble stuff. Um, but yeah, so most of it works out that the artist is thinking of things you're not thinking of, and it's a, it's a, it's much more collaborative than um, me trying to express only my vision and getting disappointed that they're getting it wrong. Um, follow up to the first part of your answer. Um, 
do you think stuff like comicsology and, and the way that they they change the reading experience? Do you think writers and artists are going to start working t uh, tailoring their work to that? Uh, they they will. We haven't figured it out yet because we're in a dual we're in a dual um, medium kind of because. Right now, uh, there's these electronic comics that are electronic. There's electronic versions of comics that were already printed. Um, there are comics that are coming out simultaneously in print and electronic. And then there are comics that are only existing on the web first and may never get to print. And there's really interesting stuff being done with um, the web first, electronic first comics. Mark Wade is doing an entire. Um, basically an imprint online, a free comic called Thrillbent. Um, uh, Google that. And he, they're trying very hard to figure out how comics can work best electronically. So for example, I was talking about the, the surprise problem of getting something on a page turn. You don't have the page turn in electronics. So what do you do? And he does, they've done these incredible things just with simple uh, JPEGs, HTML, and JavaScript, where the same panel, you click next, something changes inside the panel. Um, uh, or the panels appear next to each other one by one, so you're seeing each one of them. You have total control over what they see when. Um, you still have these weird limitations, like, well, does it look the same when it's viewed on the iPad versus the computer screen? And what if you have a little tiny little tablet, you've got that Nexus guy, I mean, uh, your, your tablet, which is... Nexus 7's up, not that tiny, it's actually perfect size. For perfect size. For comics? Um, yeah. So, because um, there's a problem, like if you've ever read electronic comics, there's a problem of, uh, when you have eyes like I do, of like getting, it, getting the text large enough to read the text, but not losing the context of what's going on. The printed pages figured this out. It's really good technology. Um, it's high res enough that I can read and see what's going on in the entire page if I want to, um, as opposed to Comixology has a lot of gimmicks to try to get you to read it, and then when you click they, next, it moves to the next a, panel. A of zooming, zooming in and out, and, 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 and that comes out. Right, but it's a whole different, you know, and they're trying to apply this a lot of times to printed comics that work yeah. really well in printed form, and they're trying to make it work. And I think we're in the, the infant stages of what people will be able to do. If you ever read, a great book to read for anyone writing prose comics or anything is Scott McCloud's books, Making Comics and Understanding Comics. So he's got two. So understanding comics is the one everybody should read for pros. And, and, and comics, by, and by the way, will be coming out in Hebrew. Um, oh, woo, woo. From from a, a, a Kinetis of Wabita. Oh, yes. uh, and making comics, he talks about uh, what happens to comics when they go to electronic form. Questions. <laughs> attachment to the characters? Yes. Oh yeah. I mean it's kind of it's kind of embarrassing, it's kind of ridiculous that I can get choked up by something I wrote myself which seems so egotistical, doesn't it? I mean I was reading a short story during the reading the other day and and because it had stuff that I had written about my daughter, I was like getting kind of choked up and still trying to talk through the sentences. I'm like, God, that is so precious. <laughs> get choked up by your own Jesus. So um, yeah, I am, a, I am emotionally connected to characters, you know, not all of them equally, but I did take to heart Stan Robinson's uh, advice, which is to love your characters. Um, so I have to, for every character, I have to be able to feel like I can see their point of view and write them from a point of view of, of love rather than scorn. And, um, uh, and so, yeah, you, you sort of get attached to them, and then you sort of, by the end of the book, you're sort of locked out of your own book, and you have to say goodbye to them too, um, and you try to replace them with new friends that you're writing, but uh, sometimes it doesn't work. And it takes time. It takes time. When you write the comics, uh, do you have a different process? Um, yeah, I, I decided with comics I was going to teach myself to write, try different, a different style of writing. So I have a, um, 
I do have an outline for what the story arc will be. Let's say it's four issues. I have a general outline for where I want to get in each issue. Maybe it's a little paragraph on each issue about what I, what I want to have done. And those will all add up to what I'd like to get done in a year. Um, so those are general guidelines. But when I'm writing them, I actually write in Microsoft Word outline mode. So I, I, um, uh, I break, I break the, um, the, the, the issue into scenes. Um, and within each scene, I have pages. And within each page, I have panels. And with each, each panel, I've got dialogue. Um, and they all are uh, formatted from H1 all the way down to H7. So I can collapse and, um, collapse and move them around. Um, and so I can see the general, so comics, more than, all, more than most things to write, is really dependent upon structure. You've got to hit these moments, and you've got to get to a certain place, a certain high point by that last page, uh, that page 22, that last page when you get it. So I'm really concerned with structure and pacing. So I do a lot of fiddling and moving scenes back, or, uh, back and forth to figure out, um, is it a four-page scene, a five-page scene, a, you know, a short one-page scene, and moving these around and trying to figure out the structure for the, for the story. Um, and then I also, um, because I wanted to learn to write more quickly, um, I gave myself permission to write any scene in any order, which I don't do in prose. Um, so I could jump between the different um, scenes that I'm working on um, and just write whatever was most interesting to me at the moment, or the most important scene, write that first, and write the filler, you know, the less important scenes, the filler scenes later. Richard. You say you say, what do you say first? <laughs> no. All right, here's gone, right? So I don't have to compete with, yeah. Um, when I read Pandemonium, and I'm sorry that I don't remember the exact quote, it was um, one of the characters said that um, fantasy is what the public um, considers to be impossible, and sci-fi is what the public considers to be possible in right circumstances. And I was wondering, um, how do you define the line between fantasy well, and that quote is from Philip K. Dick. So Philip K. Dick said... I was wondering how you describe that. Oh, well, and the next part of that, what Philip K. Dick says in that essay is, and that is essentially a judgment call. Like the line between what's possible and what's, uh, what's not possible. And so um, that's why I have trouble with genre labels, because it is sort of a judgment call about what you feel is possible or not possible. Some science, quote, science fiction is probably not possible, is as impossible as dragons. So, um, so um, I don't try to figure that out. I mean, I have some, when I, there are certain stories that are right that are based on real science, where I stick really closely to what is known science, and I'm interested in that. Like a lot of my neuroscience stories um, are as well researched as I can get them, because I'm really interested in trying to get the science at least plausible enough to tell the story I want to tell. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a judgment call. So I don't really have a good, you know, it's the, the classic problem of labeling stuff science fiction or fantasy. It's, you know, science fiction is what I point at when I say science fiction. Thank you, Damon Knight. <laughs> Love Damon Knight. One of my teachers at Clarion. Damon Knight and Kate Willem, they were fantastic. Um, more questions? Because we are getting pretty good on time. What am I writing? Science fiction or fantasy? Science fiction. You're writing science fiction, and then you can very good reason why. You can rest assured knowing that the, we hold your genre. You're good. Keep writing. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. As I said, just an observation. Yeah, you're, you're good. I really want to talk about that, though. So, <laughs> okay, let's talk about it. Well, okay, so um, why is it science fiction? Uh, it's science fiction because of the questions uh, that you ask. What 
Um, red shirt. No, you don't want to do that, Daryl. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, stay away. I'm sad because I'm close out to move from this chair. Too late. I have the mic. Yeah, there, there's, there's, a, there's a camera. Stay away from the album. <laughs> okay, um, like um, someone here said about the, the, the quotation from your book, it's actually a, a good working definition of um, fantasy. Um, dealing with, the, with the, what the public thinks is impossible and science fiction dealing with what the public thinks is possible. It's, it's actually a definition that, that, that we use here. And it is mutable. It, it changes because what we thought was possible yesterday, uh, we know it's impossible today, etc., etc., etc. And the kind of questions that you ask, and it doesn't matter now, it's true that most science fiction also deals in providing the answers to the questions that you ask. But the kind of questions that you ask about consciousness, about reality, about humanity, these are science fiction questions, not fantasy questions, because fantasy does not ask the, those questions. Fantasy does not deal with uh, the nature of reality per se, because fantasy a priori has all the answers. It's gods, it's demons, it's magic, it's whatever. It may be a particular kind of magic that you have to find out about, but it is magic and it is fine, and that's why it's fantasy. I think Science you're selling fantasy, fantasy short. Yes. I, I um, think your view of no, no, fantasy comes from the 80s. I'm simplifying things horribly, of course I am, and we can develop this forever. But again, the kind of questions that they ask, and whether it's presumed to have answers or not, and what type of answers uh, it has, that's what separates science fiction and fantasy. And what you write, the kind of questions that you ask, they're science fiction. Do you think Jonathan Carroll's Land of Laughs is science fiction? Um, Jonathan Carroll's, no. I think Jonathan Carroll does not write science fiction. Jonathan Carroll writes fantasy. And again, it's because of the sort of question and the sort of discussions that he has. And really, let's not open that up because it's, it's a whole it's seminar. Safer. But Jonathan Carroll, no matter what, he actually populates, you said furniture. Furniture does not define genre because we can have dragons in science fiction and, and spaceship in fantasies. George R. Martin and Gardner Guzwa think furniture is what defines science fiction no, fantasy. Wrong. If they came here, I'd explain why they're wrong. It's fine. <laughs> I, I've got the answer to you. All cool, I've got it. Okay, now they are. <laughs> Yeah, we know, but but yeah. How many lectures do you have this icon? Just three. Yeah, so there were three chances for people to hear your opinions. No, I, no, I, wanted, I but I wasn't at the lecture, so. Um. Why weren't you? Why weren't you? I was looking for you. What language were they in? What language were they in? Okay. Well, I, I have this theory, and I've argued with Ted Chang about this point, about what makes things science, what, what science fiction, what makes fantasy. Um, uh, I do think one of the key things that makes it feel like science fiction or fantasy is whether the characters act like they're in a science fiction novel or a fantasy novel. If they actually question what's going on, like, where did this magic come from? It feels like a science fiction novel all of a sudden, even if... Um, uh, because a lot of, in a lot of fantasy novels, nobody asks. I mean, no one's trying to get to the root problem. <laughs> but you're wrong, uh, in case you're wrong. Okay, good. Um, well, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know if fantasy cannot ask those kinds of questions. I mean, um, uh, you could say that any fantasy that asks those kind of questions is therefore science fiction, which is, you know, makes it a little easy. But like, for instance, Stoney Mayhall is a zombie story, and it's explicitly a zombie story in which the zombies obey all the rules of, of fantasy zombies, which don't make any scientific sense. They're dead, yet they're still moving. They're, they have no electrical activity in their brains, yet they're still thinking. Um, they still move around, they still don't rot. They follow all the, the zombies in my book follow all the rules that Romero laid down in that first movie. Um, but the character is a scientist. So Stoney himself is constantly trying to figure out what makes zombies, where is the conversion point, what separates them, how can he be talking, and he never gets an answer. He figures out more rules about how, what he can do or not do by the end of the novel. Um, but it never becomes, um, there never becomes any scientific explanation coming. And I try to make it clear that there is no scientific explanation even possible. That's just the facts of his universe. And so they are, they are basically the natural laws of his universe, just like if one of the natural laws was that there were dragons who, despite all the um, problems of physics, could actually get airborne. Um, 
So yeah, so I think it's a, I think it's a I think it's a tricky question. But I and that's why I sort of always try to shy away from defining myself as a science fiction writer or a fantasy writer. I, I just want to talk about these things and using whatever tools I can to, to write the story. First of all, it is of course a fascinating discussion. First of all, because I think we all agree that some people from science fiction do fantasy depending on the cultural context. Right. right. So right now my day job is I show up. It's actually more social than writing. Um, if you you know you'd think that programming would be more of an introverted task, but most of software development is about working in teams and talking to people. Um, I get that social part of my life done with, and then for the for the second half of the day, I can go sit in the corner and write, and I really enjoy that. And I haven't been able to. I was telling somebody I haven't really been able to use the programming stuff much in my fiction. Um, except to say that I just know it well enough that the details leaven in without me having to do any research. So being a web programmer for 20 years, uh, well, 1998 is when we finally got started with the web. You know, it's like all that stuff is sort of baked in. Like I know how the communication protocols work, so I don't have to, I don't have to do research on that. And so it just kind of sifts in as background detail, but I haven't written the great American Programmer novel. <laughs> a little louder. I have a follow-up question. Uh, Again louder. Uh, a follow-up question. Okay. You said uh, you need writing energy, so do you think you would not be able to write full-time all day? Oh yeah, I, I don't think I really could. Um, so the question is, you know, about talking about writing energy and would I be able to write full-time? Um, most people, most writers I know can't write in first draft mode, like the, the new stuff, for longer than four hours anyway. Um, but, um, so what I would probably do is not write any faster on the first drafts. Uh, what I would have that I really would like to have uh, m with more time available is more time, more bandwidth to be able to, um, uh, if I'm behind, be able to throw hours at something, especially in the revision stages or to do things that other writers get to do, which is be on Twitter and, and make blog posts. There would probably be auxiliary stuff I'd be doing. I don't think I would actually have more energy to write the first draft stuff. Again, the volume. Do you think some plots are, are uh, appropriate for some mediums, or do you think any plot could work on, on, on any on any medium? Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, it depends what you mean by plot. Uh, if it's um, all, all all the medium dictates is the structure that you have to do this in, and the the, the form it's going to come out with. So there are certain ideas that are going to work better as comics. Um, then that would just uh, not not work as well in prose, and there's certainly prose ideas that won't work in comics. They're too internal. You know, they require too much, um, uh, too many sentences. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. But I don't think there's any kind of story type that's that you can't do in comics or short stories or or novels. Um, it could be science fiction, fantasy. Um, 
Oh, I only write science fiction, evidently. So I, um, but it, so it's all going to come out in in whatever form. I wrote a story about a guy who has terrible, terrible allergies and ends up in an alternate world where he doesn't have allergies. There's that's pure fantasy. That was Mary Sue. But he may be gun, 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 gun. <laughs> Weird. Our yeah. time is very nearly at an end. Okay. One last short question. Short to Gary, so not you. <laughs> short and loud. <laughs> they research psychological literature for what was the last part? To enrich your work. Um, I'm married to a psychologist. <laughs> I live my research every day. Um, but I do. Have, I am constantly. I'm more interested in the, in the neuroscience, uh, you know, uh, the uh, more cognitive end of things. My wife is a, a therapist uh, who teaches people how to be. She, she has a private practice, but she also teaches people how to be counselors and therapists. Um, some more talk therapy, but um, we're both interested in in the neuroscience stuff. Um, so I do a lot of reading on, on neuroscience, um, almost all the time, because I just really enjoy it. And then I also, most of my research though is kind of predatory, and then I'm hunting for stories. I'm trying to figure out, is there some little tidbit that's storyable, to use a John Clute term. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I'd like to thank Daryl Gregory. Thank you, this is great.